Turns out that rumors of the death of the dollar may have been greatly exaggerated. I'm sure at this point you have seen all of the different articles and posts and videos claiming that a US Saudi petrodollar agreement has officially ended after either 50 or 80 years, giving Saudi Arabia now the ability to sell its oil in currencies other than the dollar, spelling the end of the dollar as we know it. We're about to head into global hyperinflation as everybody dumps the dollar. Well, it turns out that not only is this report completely false, but the conclusions that they draw actually fly in the face of what would actually happen in a death of the dollar scenario. So in this video, we are going to look at number one, what this report says and what it gets wrong. Number two, what is actually happening to the dollar in reality? Because even though this report is false, it's not all rainbows, unicorns, and sunshine for the dollar. And of course, we'll talk about ways that you can position your portfolio to profit off of this as well. So these reports are talking about an official contract, a petrodollar agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Sometimes they say it's been in place for 50 years. Sometimes they say it's been in place for 80 years. And now as a result of that terminating, Saudi Arabia can sell its oil to any country in any currency that it chooses. So here's some quick facts. Number one, this contract, at least formally, never actually existed. There is some nuance here. Don't worry, we'll get into that. Number two, Saudi Arabia has actually been free to sell its oil in other currencies this entire time. And guess what? It has actually been doing that for years now. And on top of that, not even just recently, they actually did this at the very beginning of the supposed petrodollar contract. And number three, any agreement that existed was kind of like a handshake agreement only. There was no contract, especially none that had an expiration date or a termination date, nothing that ended recently. But just like every good story, there's gotta be a few kernels of truth mixed in there to make it believable. So what are the things that we can pull out of this story that are true that actually have an impact on the real world today? Number one, there absolutely has been a petrodollar agreement in place, just nothing formal, nothing contractual. After the United States abandoned the gold standard, they absolutely needed a way to increase demand for dollars around the world, especially after everybody was trying to dump them. So an agreement with Saudi Arabia was reached where Saudi Arabia would sell its oil for dollars and Saudi Arabia would do two things with those dollars. One, they would buy American weapons. Number two, they would lend those dollars back to the United States government in the form of buying US treasuries. This would be a reserve asset for Saudi Arabia. This was very helpful for them because Saudi Arabia's currency is pegged to the dollar. So owning US treasuries as a reserve asset allows them to stabilize their currency. And absolutely zero, zilch, nothing of that agreement has changed. It is all informal and it is all still in effect. And in fact, for years now, Saudi Arabia has received other currencies for its oil and been in talks to do that more and more. This is absolutely nothing new. But the question isn't just about the Saudi Arabia petrodollar United States agreement. The question is a valid question. What is actually happening to the US dollar around the world? There's a lot of talk of BRICS. There's a lot of talk of SWIFT. There's a lot of talk of all of the shenanigans going around the world. Do we have to worry about an imminent demise in the dollar? Well, unfortunately, the answer is both yes and no. As most financial topics usually do, this one requires nuance and there are two sides to the same coin, or I should say multiple pieces to the same puzzle. So first, let's look at one piece of the puzzle, which is dollar usage around the world. According to the IMF, over the last four years, the United States dollar has increased its share of global flows from 18% up to almost 33%. And if we look at the changes in the dollar's role as a global currency and how that changed from 2012 through 2023, we can see that the dollar's role in foreign exchange transaction volume increased 1.4% to 88.4% of all transaction volume. And the dollar's use in international SWIFT payments increased a whopping 13.1% over those 10 years 
to a total of 46.5%. We can see over that amount of time, the US dollar's use in international payments rose significantly, especially recently. And that seemed to be due in large part to a severe drop off in usage by the Euro. Now, if all those charts just went completely over your head and you feel lost, don't worry, here's the takeaway. The dollar's use around the world for payments, for transactions is going up it's not going down. Not only is it going up, but it's going up increasingly more lately, which seems to run completely contrary to the narrative you might have been used to hearing that the dollar is losing its share in global transactions, that it's being used less. That is not the case. But, <laughs> and this is a big but, just because the dollar is being used more and more as payments doesn't mean it's all unicorns and sunshine like I alluded to earlier. Because for something to be used as money, it being used as a form of payment is not the only thing that matters. It being used as a store of value is also something that matters. And in the case of the dollar, that'll be looked at in terms of its usage as reserves around the world. So how is it looking on that front? Keep in mind, this is the second piece of the three piece puzzle. If we take a look at these two charts put together by Goldman Sachs, we can see that with this green line representing the total foreign holdings of US Treasury bills and US Treasuries, they have been on this severe decline for about 15 years now. This despite the fact that the dollar total foreign holdings might be going up a little and the total outstanding amount of US debt has grown significantly. Treasuries as a percentage of global reserves is on the decline. See this chart as well from the International Monetary Fund showing the dollar's share of foreign exchange reserves declining over the last decade. The blue line is the big four, while the red line is the US dollar. So the big four, which include the US dollar, the yen, the euro, and the pound, are all in decline, but especially the US dollar, while other currencies that are not a part of that big four are on the rise, again, in terms of their share in foreign exchange reserves. And if we take a look at these charts from the IMF, we can see the picture is even worse because recently the US dollar in terms of its value versus other currencies has been on the rise, which means that the US dollar share of foreign exchange reserves going down is actually worse than the reported amount. When you adjust it for the exchange rate and the interest rate, it's actually even worse. We can see from this report that the Chinese renminbi, the Canadian dollar and the Australian dollar and even other currencies other than that are all on the rise, replacing at least somewhat the currency share of the US dollar and other big four. If all of that went over your head and you feel like it was confusing, don't worry, here's the takeaway. The dollar as its use as a store of value, a savings account, the place that institutions and countries around the world use to store their value, their savings account, their reserves, the dollars usage in that role is on the decline. It gets even more interesting because there's a new player coming in over the last couple of years to take up some of that space. And that new player is not a country, it is actually that useless yellow metal gold. And we can see gold holdings and official reserve assets have been on the rise for about the last 15 years or so. If we look at this data about just central banks alone put together by the World Gold Council, we can see that recently the last two to three years have represented massive increase increases in central bank gold holdings. And of course, we wanna keep things in context when in doubt, zoom out. If we look all the way back to 1950, we can see that the ratio of gold to official foreign exchange reserves is still very low. While it has been on the rise for the last 15 years or so, it is still low compared to where it was prior to the world being on an actual gold standard, which obviously makes sense. But the question is, why the disparity? Why is the dollar growing in terms of its use in transactions and payments while its use as a store of value as savings as reserves around the world goes down? Well, this actually makes complete sense when you understand how money works. A medium of exchange or usage as payments is one essential role of money, but being a store of value, somewhere where you can save your value is another essential role of money. Now, something funny happens to the money when one of these is violated. And this has been coined Gresham's law by the guy who discovered it. But basically, when you have 
a money or a currency whose value starts to decline over time due to inflation, dilution, money printing, the store of value function of that money is compromised. And what happens is the money does not get used less. It actually gets used more. We've witnessed this happening all the way back as far as we can study financial transactions like the Roman Empire when they started diluting the gold and silver coins with other cheaper metals. What happens is people start to use the bad money more as payments and they try and hold on to anything that stores its value better than that money. Imagine you are a Roman citizen and you have a one ounce gold coin, and then the government starts to issue new coins that look like this, but they have other cheaper metals mixed in, so there's not as much gold in them. They tell you they're the exact same value, and legally, you have to spend them as if they are the same value but you know that they're not actually worth the same. So the one with a full ounce of gold, you're gonna keep, you're gonna hold on to, because you know it's actually worth more. The one that has other metal mixed in, you're gonna use that to pay, because you wanna get rid of it. You want something else instead. So you use that one for payment, because you have to pretend it's worth it, and you get to get something else instead, and you keep all the full value money for yourself. This is how it plays out over time. When you see a money that is getting slowly destroyed, the store of value function drops away first. People stop using that bad money as a store of value. But the function of it being a medium of exchange, the fact that it's being used for payments, that continues far longer. And that same exact order is how the new money that ends up replacing it happens as well. First, it starts out as just the store of value. Because if I have dollars that are not worth storing my savings in, I am not gonna use that as a store of value. Instead, I'm gonna use a different money. Maybe it's gold, maybe it's Bitcoin. I will use that as a store of value. Later, once nobody wants to accept the old bad money anymore, then the money that has just been serving as a store of value this whole time, then it starts to make its way into being used as a medium of exchange. So money starts off as a store of value and then becomes a medium of exchange. And also when that money dies, it dies first as a store of value and and it dies last as a medium of exchange. So the fact that we are seeing a slow decline in the dollar's value, and also seeing it go down as a reserve asset around the world, but up as a medium of exchange, up in terms of its usage for payments, should be no surprise to anybody who understands money or economics at all. But <laughs> there's a third piece to this puzzle. And this is a piece that many people are not looking at here. Because at this point, you probably say, man, the dollar is screwed. It's just going down. Everybody's actually trying to dump it. Not so fast. The piece of the puzzle we have not looked at yet and very many people are not looking at is debt around the world that is denominated in dollars. And just so that you can keep these three puzzle pieces straight in your head and not conflate them because they're very different. We have three things at play here. Number one, dollars being used for payments, for transactions. That usage is up. Number two, dollars being used as reserves. And as a side note, most of the time dollars are being used as reserves is when countries lend those dollars to the US government in the form of buying US treasuries, and they take that dollar debt that the government owes to them, and they use that as their reserves. Most of the time, it's not just dollars in a savings account, it's an IOU from the US government. It's part of the US national debt. It's a treasury that the US government is gonna pay dollars back to that country someday. So that's the second puzzle piece, dollar, as a use for reserves for savings around the world, that is down. The third piece of this puzzle though, which is very different than the second piece, is countries borrowing dollars. So we've got spending dollars as puzzle piece number one, we've got lending dollars or saving dollars as puzzle piece number two. Puzzle piece number three is borrowing dollars. We don't have time to get into the details in this video, but it's worth noting that every dollar in existence basically has been loaned into existence. That's how dollars are created, is through debt. Banks and central banks loan money into existence. When a dollar is created, it is done so as debt. Keep that in the back of your mind. The dollar denominated debt around the world keeps the world in a chokehold to use the dollar as currency and take the dollar as payment. By one estimate, there is over $65 trillion in just the hidden debt 
around the world by just non-US banks and shadow banks. Again, this is countries and institutions and banks and people all around the world who have borrowed money and the money that they borrowed was US dollars. Now, if you think this through step by step, you just like anybody else around the world can borrow US dollars. What does that mean you owe back US dollars? That means you have to do something to go get US dollars, which means you are going to have to produce and sell something in exchange for US dollars so that you can pay back those US dollars that you originally borrowed. And guess what? There's interest on that debt, so you have to locate more dollars than you originally borrowed. By some estimates, there's well over a hundred trillion dollars in dollar denominated debt all around the world. And yes, we have to use estimates because there is no one reporting agency, no government over all of these different banks and jurisdictions and countries. And so we don't actually have the numbers on how much dollar denominated debt out there there really is. We just know that it is enormous. Now you might think, well, everybody could just decide to default on this debt and not pay those dollars back. And you're right, and that wouldn't crush the dollar, it would send it sky high. Remember what I said earlier that all dollars are lent into existence? This means that that debt disappearing also means those dollars disappear because every dollar that's in somebody's bank account was really lent there from somebody else's bank account and so on and so forth. So as one default occurs, it means the next person in line that was gonna get those dollars can't pay back who they owe those dollars to and so on and so forth down the line. This is what happened in the Great Depression. This is a deflationary death spiral. It happens from defaults. It also happens, by the way, from austerity and paying that debt back. If everybody tries to just collect dollars and pay off the debt without getting more debt, that means the total number of dollars in the system decreases because all dollars were lent into existence. So as debt is paid off, that dollar gets destroyed. So whether the world tries to deleverage through defaults on US dollar debt, or they try and deleverage through just paying off that debt through austerity, that means fewer dollars around the world. And we know that inflation means more dollars chasing the same amount of goods and services. Deflation is fewer dollars chasing the same amount of goods or services. A lot less money around the world is a deflationary death spiral, which basically means prices plummet, which means it would basically spell the economic death of any nation that decided to try and just default on all of its dollar debt, which is why they don't do it. So yes, it turns out the dollar is here to stay much longer than many people would hope for. It is true that we are witnessing Gresham's Law play out in real time. Fewer and fewer people and institutions and nations want to hold on to dollars and dollar debt as an asset. They want to spend dollars and get rid of them. But as far as the world is addicted to debt and as long as that continues and that debt pile continues to grow, there will be continued and increasing demand for the US dollar around the world, not decreasing demand. Which brings us to the final question, what to do about this? Does this actually mean that the US dollar is safe, that it's a good thing to hold on to? Absolutely not. I'm ashamed of you for even asking that question. No, but seriously, holding US dollars is a direct wealth transfer to the state, to the government. Your dollars are losing officially three, four percent every single year in purchasing power, which means the real amount that they're losing in purchasing power from inflation is probably five or six percent. Depending on where you live and what your cost of living is and what kind of things you have to buy for your quality of life, that might be even higher. So if you enjoy the idea of transferring three to six percent of your purchasing power and your wealth on top of your taxes to the government every single year, then by all means, save US dollars, hold US dollars. But if that doesn't sound very appealing to you, at the very minimum, get a high yield savings account that pays you at least 5%, get a money market fund that pays you at least 5%, don't do a CD, don't do a long-term treasury. If you like things like treasuries, go with T-bills because those are very short-term and they have the highest rate. At the very least, you get into a high yield savings account, money market fund, or T-bills, at least you'll be breaking even most likely and you'll be receiving the same amount in interest that you're losing the government through inflation. If you wanna take it one step farther from that, you can invest in a portfolio of uncorrelated assets, intelligently hedge, make small asymmetric bets with a small, smart percentage of your portfolio, and overall, you can beat inflation through capital appreciation. And if you wanna take it even one step farther than that, you can actually literally short the dollar and profit from the dollar's decline by using fixed rate debt to buy income-producing assets. You just have to make sure that the debt 
has an interest rate that is fixed. The asset that you're buying produces income and that income is more than the cost of servicing that debt. And as long as those three things are true, you will have an effective dollar short. And if you'd like me to help you apply these concepts and strategies to your investing, join my private membership group, Heresy Financial University. Link is below. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.